It took an elaborate deception for the Ukrainian armed forces to liberate most of the Kharkiv region in a matter of days, something that took Russians months to capture in the first place. While NATO supplied weapons combined with Ukrainians' strong will to fight certainly contributed to this massive success, it was also the Russian army's stunning incompetence that led to a humiliating defeat that was ironically celebrated with fireworks in Moscow. Instead of building trenches, Russians were building saunas. Instead of fighting, they were fleeing. Nobody was ready for this outcome. Not even Ukrainians or NATO allies expected the Kharkiv front line to collapse so quickly. Retreating from arguably their biggest loss in this war, they were agonized. Acting out of spite, Russians resorted to a tactic they had avoided up to this point, which created one of the darkest moments for Ukrainians. But it's not what you think. For months, Ukrainian officials were talking about liberating the occupied southern region, which lies on the western bank of the Dnipro River. The logic was simple. Destroying the only three bridges across the Dnipro River would entrap roughly 20,000 Russian soldiers on the west bank. Once Ukrainians received sufficient numbers of American HIMARS artillery systems, they started destroying the bridges, which by the way is no easy task. Each time Russians would try to repair the bridges, HIMARS would hit them again. Eventually, Russians gave up. They started building pontoon bridges and using barges to transfer equipment across the river. Of course, Ukrainians started targeting those too, as HIMARS rockets have an accuracy of about 6 feet. Additionally, Ukrainians kept adding pressure by constantly locating and destroying Russian ammunition depots, command and control centers, and frontline positions throughout the region. Currently, it's estimated that Russian forces can only transfer up to 20% of the supplies needed to the western bank of Dnipro compared to what they could prior to the destruction of the bridge. All this mayhem made Russians very worried. It is pivotal for them to hold on to the west bank of Dnipro because it serves as an important bridgehead for any future westward offensive. On August 29, 2022, Ukrainians began their campaign of recapturing their lost territory in the south. As the fighting intensified for about a week, the Russians didn't want to take any chances and started sending reinforcements, which included the most elite airborne forces known as VDV. Of course, this meant that by reinforcing the west side of Dnipro, other areas were weakened, including the front lines in the Kharkiv region. Keep in mind that redeploying forces is not an easy task. It can take days. Units must pack up first, travel for hundreds of miles, cross the river and redeploy. In an ingenious move, Ukrainians managed to lure the most mobile and capable Russian forces into a trap because once the Russian reinforcements crossed the Dnipro River to the other side, they would never be able to redeploy in time to Kharkiv, where Ukrainians were planning a devastating blow. The thing is, Russians knew that something was brewing up near Kharkiv. For weeks prior, information about massive Ukrainian military buildups near Kharkiv was circulated even by Russian telegram channels and military bloggers like Igor Strelkov. But for one reason or another, nothing was done to prepare for a potential Ukrainian counteroffensive near Kharkiv. If anything, quite the opposite. You see, some of the most capable Russian troops and equipment from the Kharkiv and Izum occupied territories were actually sent to attend the week-long Vostok 2022 military exercise that kicked off at the beginning of September in Russia's Far East and the Sea of Japan. Normally, tens of thousands of Russian troops would participate in joint exercises with China, Mongolia, and India. But this year, according to British Defense Intelligence, only 15,000 Russian troops were taking part in the exercises due to the war in Ukraine. Nevertheless, it was quite a performance. As the Russian army was putting on a show in front of President Putin and Defense Minister Shoigu, with Russian tanks demonstrating their abilities to cross rivers while submerged, Thousands of miles away, Russian soldiers were abandoning their tanks that had got stuck in Ukrainian rivers. 
With the highly capable and mobile infantry units of the VDV being sent to the southern front and other capable troops attending military exercises, the Russian forces in the Kharkiv front lines were spread very thin. In fact, they mostly consisted of Mobiki. Mobiki refers to soldiers who were mobilized in the Donetsk and Luhansk People's Republic, both voluntarily and randomly pulled off the streets. They are not a regular Russian army and are extremely undertrained and underarmed. Mobiki are known to have tense relationships with the Russian army that supplies them and often view themselves as cannon fathers. So not only are they inadequate, but also not the most motivated group of soldiers to fight, although some of them are. As it should be, nobody knew when the Kharkiv counteroffensive would begin, besides top Ukrainian and NATO officials. But all of a sudden, on September 6, 2022, Russian telegram channels started exploding with messages like Balaklia is in hell and that Ukrainians took over Verbivka, northwest of Balaklia. But Ukrainian media and officials were still pretty quiet about all this, even though everyone knew something was up. What Ukrainian forces were trying to do was encircling Izum the same way Nazi Germany did back in 1942. The key was to rush in with speed and cause panic among Russian soldiers. Instead of storming cities like Balaklia, which would dramatically slow down Ukrainian forces dealing with Russian resistance, they bypassed them and encircled them, in many cases by blowing bridges around these settlements. Following Balaklia, Ukrainians moved northeast to Volokhiv Yar, then Shevchenkov and then Kupyansk. Again, Ukrainians would encircle the settlements, then wait for reinforcements to arrive before moving in. The key was not to take cities, but to take over the supply routes. And as we know from the early days of the war, Russian logistics is crap. There's just no other way of putting it. There were two important steps that helped the Ukrainian counteroffensive. First, a small reconnaissance team would scout the area for pockets of Russian resistance and relay the coordinates to artillery units which would immediately fire upon them. And second, before Russians were able to reorganize themselves, Ukrainians threw all the reserves from behind, somewhere between three to eight times more troops than Russia had in the area, which completely overwhelmed them. That's according to Russia, of course because Ukrainian officials claimed that Ukrainian forces were outnumbered 2 to 1 by the Russian defending forces. Meanwhile, Russian media was proclaiming that this was all a massive strategic plan to lure Ukrainians in to attack and destroy them. Who knows, maybe it was, but man, did it backfire. The next move was the highly mobile Ukrainian mechanized forces spreading to the south of Kupyansk and taking over two key areas, Senkov and Horokhovavka. Capturing these villages allowed Ukrainian forces to block two important supply routes to Izum, which was left with one remaining supply route through Oskil, although the bridge in Oskil was already under constant Ukrainian artillery fire. The encirclement of Izum was eminent. Izum itself was a highly fortified stronghold with large stockpiles of ammunition, artillery and command and control equipment. Thousands of Russian soldiers were stationed at the city, including the Russian First Guards Tank Regiment. By the morning of September 9th, it became clear that Ukrainians had won Kupyansk and there was no strategic plan to counterattack and destroy Ukrainian forces. Panic set in throughout the Russian military. And you know it's true because Russian media was broadcasting that there was no panic. Russian reserves arrived at Kupyansk just as quickly as they were destroyed because the reserves were thrown into the fight without much strategic thinking. It was reported that at least part of the Russian forces already stationed in Kupyansk refused to defend the city and simply fled. Meanwhile, in Izum, Russian forces were in grave danger. There was only one supply route left through the town of Oskil. If Izum was to be encircled, it would be a devastating blow to Russia. As Ukrainian armed forces started advancing toward Izum, Oskil and Lumen from the south, 
the Russians made the decision to withdraw. There were fireworks as Russian forces retreated from Izum, but that wasn't the only fireworks. Around the same time, President Putin was in Moscow, opening a new Ferris wheel during Moscow's annual City Day celebration. But let's be real, cancelling fireworks in Moscow would have been an admission of defeat. After all, it took one month for Russians to capture Izum, and Ukrainians took it back in three days. As a result of the counteroffensive, Russia withdrew its forces from almost the entire Kharkiv region due to the unexpected collapse of their entire Kharkiv front. Ukrainians were able to liberate cities and villages in the region, some with and some without fighting. In most places like Izum and Vovchansk, Russians simply left. Ukrainians report that in the period of September 6th to 11th, Russians lost 2,850 troops and 590 pieces of equipment, with over 200 military vehicles being captured. This is in addition to thousands of Russian soldiers who were captured. Despite heavy losses, the Russian First Guards tank regiment stationed in Izum was able to escape the encirclement. This is partly because Ukrainians focused primarily on the city of Kupiansk in the north, and didn't transfer the forces needed to destroy the Russian forces leaving Izum in time. Another reason was that Ukrainian forces south of Izum were unable to breach the front. Currently, there are two versions for the reasons behind the defeat of the Russian army in eastern Ukraine. Treason or incompetence. Some say that someone up high in military ranks decided to do nothing on purpose because they knew Ukrainians were building a big force near Kharkiv. And by nothing, I mean all they had to do was transfer some of the First Guards tank regiment from Izum to Balaklia to defend against the counteroffensive. While realistically, that transfer would not have been sufficient to stop the Ukrainian forces. It would have just bought the Russians some time until reinforcements arrived. Arguably, by not risking the First Guards tank regiment to fight the counteroffensive, Russians lost an entire area. So what did the Russians do after this massive defeat? They fired over a hundred million dollars in the form of 12 missiles at three different power plants in eastern Ukraine, causing a huge blackout that was experienced by half of the country. By the morning, the power had been restored in some regions, but a few hours later, Russians fired upon key electrical infrastructure again causing more blackouts. Russian telegram channels exploded with messages like finally and keep going. The infamous Igor Strelkov, who among other crimes was responsible for shooting down the Malaysia Airlines Flight 17, which killed all 298 people on board, responded by saying that Russians should have attacked Ukrainian civil infrastructure from day one and that they should do it daily from now on. Who knows, maybe they will. Ukrainian officials are reporting that Russia has stopped sending any new units into Ukraine since retreating from the Kharkiv region. Reportedly, the units in Russia are refusing to join the war for three major reasons. They don't trust their commanders, they have a large number of casualties, and they don't understand the direction that the war is going. This was probably the biggest Ukrainian victory in this war so far even bigger than when Russian forces fled Kyiv, because in that instance, it was still a Russian initiative. President Putin decided to relocate his troops to fight somewhere else. But this time, Ukrainian forces took the initiative, forcing Russians to retreat. It seems like the Russian army is past its culmination. They are demoralized, under-equipped, and exhausted. But the question is, at this very point, is there any real path to victory for Russia?